back with his unit and go with the first troops on Japan. Uh, my youngest brother was in the Marines and he went through uh, West Coast and was in the amphibious tractors. They're, they're actually a tank, but they barely float in water. And they're called amphibs and he was in the 3rd Amphibian Battalion. Uh, my brother was in the Army and he was in the anti-aircraft section and I woke up and it wasn't uh, Pearl Harbor but it was VE Day and I knew that he was in an action. He was over in uh, England and so they were trying to protect England from the invasion coming from Europe and I was so excited and thinking how busy he would be and when I got to work, I was still at Bear Stearns and I helped at the switchboard when they got busy. And that switchboard was like a Christmas tree. Everybody wanted to talk to their customer or somebody and discuss what was going on. I would like to mention briefly, uh, last year at this gathering, John Kerr was there. He's since, since passed away. But he was a sniper on uh, Iwo Jima, and you've all, I'm sure, seen the Iwo Jima Memorial, and he was injured just about uh, a few hundred yards from that from that memorial when the where the flag went up. Uh, how many of you kids know uh, who Yamashita was in the in the during the uh, Pacific War? Have you ever studied about Yamashita? He was the leader of the Japanese armies. And uh, we had a, uh, they, when we were company clerk over there, they, they asked for 24 soldiers to come and guard. We, I stood guard for him when they hung him. We had a gallows up there in Las Vegas, and they, they hung these guys. And a lot of the people that were there for desertion or AWOL, and they asked me to be one of the guards out of the 24 to stand guard for them. They hung Yamashita. I got a picture of the gallows where they hung them. And not only the, the prisoners of war, they hung a lot of people over there. They, uh, even there were some Americans that uh, were for, there for desertion or, or went AWOL and didn't serve in one serving the service. And uh, so that was the. So if any of you want to see the picture of those gallows, the Yamashita was hung him. They, they hung him and we had to stand guard for, for uh, two hours while he was hanging up there. And uh, then, they, then they took him away and we got released. For those of you that were here stateside, he wants to know what it was like to be a student, a high school student, during World War II. Yeah. <laughs> I was in high school at the time because they called a big assembly. That's the way the uh, main part of the schools on Main Street in Mount Vernon. We had a big assembly class there, and they called everybody in and uh, tell us about the war. Of course, none of us thought we'd be around long enough maybe to enter it, but uh, as a sophomore, it didn't take long, two or three years, if you were in the service. I want to mention, I did bring my Marine Corps uniform. It's on the chair there. And I was issued that uniform 68 years ago, last month. And uh, it stood up well. I, I did talk about the combat engineers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If anybody wants to model that, see what you'll look like if you decide to on a military career, why help yourself? I just wanted to mention one thing, and this is Benny mentioned that he did not go to high school. That was kind of common. So.
How would you compare technology from like World War II to now? Bryce's question was about the technology that you used for the war in World War II compared to technology that is used by our troops today. So maybe even sharing what technology or lack thereof you did use. John, you can start to use the radio. Well, I think there's quite a difference. Uh, I'm not a technology man, but uh, I'd hate to be at war right now. I, uh, I don't, I, I'm not a technology man either, but, but when I think back in uh, when, when we went into service in 1945, we had we didn't even know what drugs were then. Nobody ever ever had any drugs around then, or didn't you, you ever heard of them? So that's part of the things that we uh, we were pretty thankful for. Uh, now. Uh, a guy can sit in a station somewhere in the United States and send a drone 7,000 miles and drop a drop a uh, explosive within an eight or ten feet range. Uh, the difference is when I was in the combat engineers, they trained us to run these problems, and uh, you start this problem and they have small arms fire. And then they'd start advancing and you'd come to this barbed wire entanglement and one fellow would have what they call Bangalore torpedoes. He'd shove those under their cap and set them off and they would cut barbed wire and posts and everything for 18 feet wide so tank tanks could get through there. And then I was right behind that section with two 10-pound pack charges of C2, which is enough to blow up half of Mount Vernon. And my job, was, my job was to hold those up off the ground while these other charges were going on. And so what I'm trying to point out is back then everything was hand labor. You went through all this problem and, and you got up close enough, one guy with a flamethrower would put three or four bursts of flame there and then I was supposed to run up there and put these pack charges on this bunker. So everything was, everything was, Slavery, you know. I mean, there was no, no mechanics to it. Another thing, in, uh, during the Second World War, it was, they were really strict. I mean, you had, when they told you to do something, you did it. If not, you, you got punished for it in some way. Even if you had to go uh, wash dishes in, or something, they, they they really had strict laws and rules, and when they told you to do something, that was it. That's what they meant. They were really strict. Another question? I can remember out at uh, Pearl Harbor when the war hit war in Japan. A bunch of us were out fooling around, and uh, I lost my sailor hat. And I ran into an officer, and he said, Sailor, where's your hat? I looked at him and I said, I don't know. <laughs> he asked when you went into the service, were you in with anyone that you happen to know, or did you just get to know people in your group? Well, luckily, when I went overseas to Pearl Harbor, I ran into two guys to Mount Vernon. And what we used to do on Sunday, we were over there about together about four months, we'd compare around who had the best dinner on Sunday, and that's where we had it. <laughs> My regret uh, from World War II is that I had so many friends that we worked with and everything that we didn't write their names down so we could have a reunion or meet again after the war. And, and I know I called a couple of them, one in Missouri and one in Indiana that I remembered, but there was, we were so close in World War II and helping each other that I wish we had kept that on, kept doing that now and after the war. 
I went into the service, I was down at Fort Leonard, Missouri. Army sergeant there was showing, showing us how to make bed sacks, they called them. But how to make the bed, that type of thing. And I thought, well, I'm in the Army now. And a guy came through with a clipboard and he said, we have room for two Marines today. And I looked over at this fellow I knew from, from Muscatine. And I said, what do you think? He said, let's take it. <laughs> and so that's how I came to being in the Army or in the Marines. She asked, what do you remember about your first couple of days that you were in boot camp or you were being processed in the military? What stands out? I'll be glad to answer that. I was lonesome as heck. <laughs> I was scared to death because they they started telling us what they were going to do and where we are going and everything and we just, just had to do what they said. Picked us up at the depot in a cattle truck hauled us out the base and unloaded us at the hygienic center. And that was the bare room with the benches. Everybody sat down on the bench and they gave us a, a brown heavy paper about three foot square. And they said take off all your clothes except your underwear and your socks. Wrap it up in that paper and put your address on it to send them home. Finished that, then we walked by this incinerator and we took up our underwear and socks and threw them in there. <laughs> went, in, went into the next room and the barber was there and we got a 30 second haircut. Just everything's gone. <laughs> went from there into the shower, came out of the shower and stepped up to a counter and they started throwing our first issue of clothes at us. And, and you didn't want, didn't want to drop any because they, they wanted you to be regimented. <laughs> Anyhow, that was my first 45 seconds in the core. All that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so what I want to do is give each of you an opportunity. So your, your generation is referred to as the greatest generation in the history of America. And I think what would be very poignant for them to hear is, what do you think is most important for them to know as members of this generation? Why was your generation so special? Or what can they take away from what you learned in living through the war and after the war? Kind of a, a piece for them as a closing opportunity for each of you. Well, that's not too difficult for me to say. I should have been a better student when I was in school. Discipline. <laughs> and I always wished I would win the high school, but uh, I, I want to tell all of you to, to really when somebody tells you to do something, do it. And do it right. That's what we were taught. And, and we, we had one guy in the Army that I had to say that uh, he didn't even know where Iowa was. He was from Maryland. He didn't know where Iowa was, on the map. Iowa was on the map. But before he got out of that service, he knew where Iowa was. I say listen to your parents all the time and listen to your teachers. I say, uh, when you get time on your computer, uh, type in a message to Garcia, and it'll bring you up a writing by Albert Hubbard, and I think you'll find it interesting as a guide to uh, how to how to perform yourself and take care of uh, yourself. Fit into the, fit into the 
a message to Garcia. Well, I remember what Fred said one day. If somebody offered me a million dollars, I wouldn't go back and do it again. But I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience I had and what I learned. And I see things that he does, because he was trained into engineers, <laughs> just around the house, in the yard. Who knows what's going to come out of the tool shop, because he learned so much, and it's good for all of you to know. Getting back to Benny's statement a bit ago about, uh, about keeping in touch, I did keep in touch with five different fellows for years and years and years. The only thing is that I've lived them and <laughs> they're, they're all gone. As are uh, Benny and I and John and I think Betty Conrad and I, and I don't know who else are the only World War II veterans right around this area that I know of. Yeah, Bob Gaines. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is give you an opportunity. We have about three minutes left before the bell rings to come up and to shake the hands and to thank our vets for coming. And then my seventh hour is going to stay, so there will be another smaller group in here. But if you want to come up and shake your hands on their way out to the hallway and quietly get your back to the Always think. Always think. Only slept in the shoulder. Oh. 